TII item 388, April 3rd, 2016, iOS 9.3.1, and iPhone SE. Welcome to Today in iPhone. Yeah, I like it a lot. Today in iPhone. Hey, go Oh, yeah. My beautiful iPhone, which I never have out of my hand and that I do everything with and has become an extension of who I am. This episode is sponsored by Bowl and Branch. Visit bowlandbranch.com and use promo code TII to save 20% off your order and to get free shipping. This episode of Today on iOS is brought to you by Harry's.com, where you can use promo code TII to save $5 off your first order. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rob, and this is the Today in iOS podcast. First up, I want to thank Steve for sending in the music here in the background. Steve wrote, Hi, Rob. The song is called Outer Space Chamber and was created on an iOS device using GarageBand and a lot of other apps. Regards, Steve Al, a.k.a. Rabbi Steve. Folks, for more info on how Rabbi Steve put together his songs, go back and listen to the beginning of episode 381. It was very extensive and detailed. Thanks, Steve, again for the music. And folks, I'll put the full song at the end of the episode. Also want to thank Scott for sending in the artwork for today's show. Scott wrote the following. Hey Rob, I took these pictures down at the Tidal Basin Easter weekend and when the cherry blossoms were in full bloom. I used my iPhone 6 Plus and Photar to edit the pictures. I hope everyone in your listening audience will enjoy these photos and maybe one day in their lives can see and witness the beauty in person. Regards, Scott from DC Capitol Hill. Thanks, Scott, for sending in this artwork. And folks, you can see Scott's artwork in the free TI app via the bonus button for episode 388 or at Instagram.com slash Today in iOS and also as a standalone post in the VIP section and at Facebook.com slash Today in iOS. If you have some artwork and or music you have created on your iOS device that you would like to share with the audience, please email it to me at todayinios at gmail.com. Please make sure to include which app or apps you use to create said artwork and or music. In this segment of How Wrong Were They, we have the following quote. Quote, when Apple introduces its iPhone this month, will it pass the acid test? In my opinion, no. The iPhone will be a major disappointment. The hype has been enormous. Apple says its iPhone is literally five years ahead of any other mobile phone. A stock market analyst says, quote, the iPhone has the potential to be even bigger than the iPad. Unquote. I think not. Unquote. Al Rise, Ad Age Blogs, 18th of June, 2007. First, I want to know the name of that analyst that got it so right. Sadly, no reference to whom that was. But this just goes to show you, nine years ago, how negative sentiment was about the iPhone in general. This guy was writing for Ad Age. Typically, that industry was pro Apple. Right now, I am seeing a bunch of negative articles about the SE, or if not negative, pretty much dismissive. But feedback from you, the listeners, has been showing a lot of people ordering the SE. It'll be interesting to see at the end of the month how Apple conference call goes and if they mention the SE. This week we have promo codes for the app The Hit List. Three words. Here is the review from the dev. The Hit List. Designed for today's busy life, the Hit List handles to-dos with the perfect balance of ease of use and app power. Using the Hit List is as easy as making lists, and powerful enough to let you plan it out, forget about it, and then act at the right time. App purchase includes access to the Hitless Sync service across iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, and your Mac. For more information, go to thehitlist.com. The Hit List, simply powerful to-dos. Well, thanks to the dev for their review of their app, The Hit List, and for sending in the promo codes giveaway. Folks, if you would like a chance for a promo code for this app, please send an email to todayinios at gmail.com and put HIT in the subject line. A quick reminder, if you are an app dev or an iBook author, email me if you want your app or iBook featured in the promo giveaway segment for free. We just need the five promo codes or more to give away. Simply email me at todayinios at gmail.com and please include a 60 second or less audio review of your app or iBook, indicating you are the dev or the author up front. Also, when you send in those promo codes, please make sure to let me know when they expire. This episode was a little late because last week I was at Microsoft Build in San Francisco. That is Microsoft's version of WWDC. Microsoft invited me out. Actually, they flew me out on their dime, put me up on their dime 
for the event. So yes, I have been doing this show now for over nine years, and Microsoft is the one that has me come out to cover their developer event first. Not Apple, but Microsoft. Hey, friends in Cupertino, are you listening? Just saying. They also brought out Joshua from Android Authority and the folks from iFreaks. So yes, Microsoft is definitely looking to reach out to devs from multiple platforms. In future episodes, I'll be playing some of the interviews I recorded while at the event. I will say this, I learned a lot at the event, and it definitely showed me some great tools for devs for iOS apps, regardless of what language you are using to develop in. And before the event, if you had asked me what language to use to develop an iOS app, I would have said Swift, um, Swift, and oh yeah, Swift. And now I can see where it really does depend a bit on your experience and the goals of that app, and well, more on that in future episodes when I play some of those interviews. Thanks Microsoft for the invite, the very warm welcome that you gave me, and the education more importantly. Oh, and just in case anyone in Cupertino is curious, yes, yes, I am available to come out in June to cover WWDC. On the last episode, with regards to updating iOS 9.3, I said the following, quote, iOS 9.3 is available today. Should you download it today? I say wait a few days, just because everyone else is downloading it, and most likely iOS 9.3 Goldmaster will be the most stable, bug-free, single-dot update ever, thanks to the seven betas. Most likely, that is. So that is another reason to wait. Let's make sure it is okay, unquote. Um, yeah. If you had an older iOS device, you are probably glad you listened to that advice. As iOS 9.3 definitely did have issues for some. Not all, not most, but some. And that some seemed to be on older iOS devices where the update would hang and not let you update if you did not have your old password and in some cases kind of pseudo-brick the phones or the old iOS devices. It was the older iPads too. Apple acknowledged that issue, saying it was working on a fix to address the activation issue, and then actually did deliver on said fix a couple days later. So one issue down. Others, and this is actually a more widespread issue, are reporting issues with links not working in apps to open Safari, or links also not working in Safari. Quote, a number of iPhone and iPad users found Safari, Mail, Messages, Notes, Chrome, and some other pre-installed and third-party apps would crash or freeze when tapping on long or long pressing on a web link, unquote. And then Apple released iOS 9.3.1, and the second major issue with iOS 9.3 was fixed, or so it is reported by Apple. According to the Apple's change logs, iOS 9.3.1, quote, fixes an issue that caused apps to be unresponsive after tapping on links in Safari or other apps, unquote. I personally noticed an issue with 9.3 where I lost connection to my Apple Watch and had to reboot the phone to finally get that connection back. Maybe that was a one-time thing with just me, but it was the first time since I've had an Apple Watch I can remember having to do that. So maybe there was some other bugs in 9.3 as well. So yes, even with seven betas, That was not enough to get rid of all the issues, and hence why I always recommend you wait a week or so before updating. Obviously, if you updated to 9.3, it is best now to update to 9.3.1. And if you were one of those that took my advice and have held off updating to iOS 9.3, waiting for this episode to come out for me to say, release the hounds, well, release the hounds. It does look good for you now to update to iOS 9.3.1 as well. Johnny Evans over at Computer World had a post titled, quote, iOS 9.3 is Apple's most stable iOS yet, data claims, unquote. What, you say? But Rob, you just went over two major bugs on iOS 9.3. Yes, yes I did. But as Johnny points out, quote, these bugs were quite annoying, but didn't affect everybody. And for most people, the new iOS has been problem free, unquote. And then he quotes the company, Apptelligent, formerly known as Criticism, Quote, OS 9.3, it should be iOS there, guys, but OS 9.3 is Apple's largest mid-cycle release in a long time. Despite the bug, iOS 9.3 stands as Apple's most stable new release in years, unquote. And then they showed data to back that up, showing where the average crash rate over the past eight days was 2.2% for iOS 9.3, which they showed was by far the most stable iOS version, and quote, 
the rate at which apps crash on all Android versions continues to exceed that of the relatively crash-free iOS ecosystem, unquote. Not surprising on that factoid. So yes, iOS 9.3 was not perfect. And yes, there were issues. And yes, you were best to wait to update. But those issues were fixed with iOS 9.3.1. And it is now looking like iOS 9.3.1 was the update you were looking for. And speaking of updates and upgrades, if you have not updated, upgraded your Apple TV 4th Gen to the latest version, you will want to do so. Go to settings and check to see if the update is there. Strangely, I have had my settings set to auto-update, but it did not, and I had to manually update it. So just because you have it set to auto-update, don't assume it actually, you know, auto-updates. The key feature upgrades for Apple TV 4th Gen to the latest version of tvOS is with Siri and Dictation. You can now ask Siri to find a show or a movie, and it will look through selected apps to find that content. You can also dictate to Siri, instead of trying to enter text, the old really annoying and tough way that you had to do it. You can now uh, have folders, uh, nice to put all your games into those. You can connect a Bluetooth keyboard to your Apple TV, and it now syncs better with photos in your iCloud account, including live photos. Siri dictation really makes using the YouTube app, well, usable, finally. And you just go to the search box and you just type in that you want to look for, say, 1,000 watt go-kart. Siri, for me at least, has been doing a good job of recognizing what I'm saying, and then it simply searches for what you look for, and it really does make the YouTube app finally, well, usable. should also point out, the last episode I said the new 9.7-inch iPad Pro would make those of us that purchased a 12.9-inch feel a little jealous, as all the specs seem to be better. Well, that is not 100% accurate. Seems the 9.7 inch version only has 2 gig of RAM versus the 4 gig of RAM on the 12.9 inch version. That's kind of a big deal. Here's a quick updated rundown of the differences between the 9.7 inch iPad Pro and the 12.9 inch iPad Pro. Camera, 12 megapixels for the 9.7, 8 megapixels for the 12.9. Live photos and 4K video recording and Hey Siri supported 9.7 inch yes, 12.9 inch no. Colors, Rose gold, none for the 12.9, all the other colors for the 9.7. Display resolution, 2048 by 1536 for the 9.7, 2732 by 2048 for the 12.9. The 9.7 also has a less reflective screen and improved LTE. Processor speed, 9.7 is slightly slower, 12.9 is slightly faster. Seems Apple is clocking the A9X at a slightly slower speed on the 9.7 versus 12.9. No idea if this is because of battery life or heat dissipation or a combo thereof. By the way, slightly slower means just that. 2.16 gigahertz for the 9.7 versus 2.25 gigahertz for the 12.9 unit. Fast charging is supported. 9.7 inch? No. 12.9 inch? Yes. Really, the biggest difference between the two is the RAM. Again, 2 gigabytes of RAM for the 9.7, 4 gigabytes for the 12.9. And I say biggest difference because some point in the future, there will likely be an update of iOS that will require a minimum of 4 gig of RAM. And at that time, the 12.9 inch iPad Pro with 4 gig of RAM will get the update, but the 9.7 inch with just 2 gig of RAM will not need to remember to come back to these show notes four or five years from now and reread this on why those complaining at the time that their 9.7 inch iPad Pro uh, could could not update, but my 12.9 inch could. And well, now you know, and I hope anyone that purchased a 12.9 incher is feeling a little less buyer's remorse after going through those differences. I mentioned in the opening How Wrong Were They segment, negative sentiment out there, or some negative sentiment out there around the SE. One of those articles was from BidnessTech, or BidnessEtcetera.com. It's spelled B-I-D-N-E-S-S-E-T-C right there. I should have known to look away. But anyway, I did not, so bear with me. From the article with regards to the SE, quote, U.S. Consumer Intelligence Research Partners, SERP, has released data that predicts 
that only 4.6 million iPhone SE units will be sold in 2016 in the U.S. as 80 million plus larger screened iPhones and iPhone S 6 and 6S series users are unlikely to switch to a smaller size. This leaves limited opportunity for the SE to penetrate the market, unquote. SERP stated that there are approximately 109 million active iPhones in the U.S., with 62 million being the 6 and, and 6 Plus, and 18 million being the 6S and 6S Plus. The remaining 29 million, they say, are the older units. But looking at the graph for December, they showed no installed user base for the 5 or 4S or earlier in the U.S. And, and well, that's just not so. That's just not even close to so. That is just so wrong. They showed some in earlier charts for the 5 and other, but then they all go away in December, starting with the 5C and then going up from there. And again, we know that's not so. Still, many users with the 5 and the 4S and, or and the 4 and even the 3GS are running around out there. Again, based on feedback I'm getting from listeners, they were excited about having the more powerful A9 and the easier to hold and operate with one hand and fit in any pocket 4-inch size. It will be interesting to see if Apple gives any hint of how the SE is doing on the next conference call at the end of the month. Maybe I'm biased, as my wife really, really, really likes the 4-inch size, and I'm hearing the same from others. Uh, maybe the 4-inchers out there are just the vocal minority, but I think not. I think this will do well. Here's one email I received on this. Hey, Rob. A very few months ago, I paid $749 for a 64-gig iPhone 6S. Now I can pay $499 for a 64-gig iPhone SE, which has almost all the attributes of the 6S. As I am visually impaired, the smaller screen is not a problem, perhaps even a plus. So I would give up some as-of-yet-not-available LTE speeds and have inferior front camera, who cares, have a slower Touch ID sensor, not a big deal, and likely have a slower flash storage, although that wasn't mentioned, all in all worth $250 savings. Regards, Kevin Barry. Thank you, Kevin, for that email. And by the way, I should point this out. I'm actually recommending my dad get the iPhone SE. He had asked me about a month ago about getting a new uh, phone, and he's from a flip phone generation. And he was going to get an iPhone, and I said, whoa, 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 he's going to get the 5S. I said, no, 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 hold on, there's likely a new iPhone. So we're getting him, or he's going to get himself, the iPhone SE. I'm going to go over that with him when I meet up with him next week in Disney World. And speaking of iPhone SE sales reports, initial reports coming out of China are that Apple had pre-orders of the iPhone SE of 3.4 million units, with the gold being the top choice and the rose gold coming at close second. The 3.4 million number, of course, is not from Apple, but rather from data supplied by local retailers, as reported by CNBC. If those numbers are close to the real numbers, then Apple will exceed the 10 to 15 million range that analysts had predicted for sales for the SE for the whole year. So yeah, at least initial reports, seems like the SE is doing well. There's a video out there of three iPhones submerged in water and running, well, at least at the beginning. The iPhone 5S, the iPhone 6S, and the SE. The iPhone 5S showed water damage after about five minutes, but the 6S and the SE continued to work fine even after being in the water for an hour. Most likely, Apple is using the same connector gaskets that we saw introduced in the 6S and 6S Plus series. And luckily, we don't have to wonder if I'm right. We can find out as iFixit released their teardown of the iPhone SE. As always, Apple has their don't open me up pentalobe screws in there, which by this point, anyone who's even remotely interested in opening an iPhone has two or three of these pentalobe screwdrivers around. I know I have more than that. First off, the displays of the SE and the 5S are pretty much identical, not surprisingly as they had the same specs. But even better news is that they are identical, as in a replacement screen for the 5S worked on the SE and vice versa. So replacement screens are already very widely available for the SE. I know some people want a 3D touch, but given the lower cost nature of the SE, the replacement repair of the screen is now also a much lower cost item than if it was a unique new 3D touch screen for it. The battery in the SE is not the same as the 5S. It's better. 
it is 1624 milliamp hours versus the uh, for the SE versus just 1560 milliamp hours for the 5S. Okay. 4% jump doesn't sound like much, but a 4% jump is better than the same or less per water issues. This is what iFix found. Quote, also of note, waterproof seals. There be foamy silicon seals surrounding some, but mysteriously not all, of the logic board connections. The front camera, volume controls, and rear camera connectors all get fancy waterproofing treatment, while the LCD, digitizer, battery, and lightning connector assembly all seemingly go without, unquote. Let me just say this, waterproof and water resistance are two different things, and what they really should have said was water resistance. I'll get into that in an email I read on the next episode. I am sure there will be many, many more videos of the iPhone SE in water, on purpose or accidentally, and by the sounds of it from iFixit, some of them are going to have issues, as it does not sound like Apple did the gasket silicon seals around all the logic board connectors this time around. Still, it is a big improvement from the iPhone 5S, which had none of this. Repairability for the SE was 6 out of 10, which might not sound good, but is actually better than any or most other iOS devices. So any of the other current iOS devices, that's it's better than. And then when you add in the lower cost for screen replacement, because you can find replacement screens pretty cheap out there, it's, it's a good low-cost device. I don't know if it even warrants getting a warranty for. I want to thank the folks at Bowling Branch for sponsoring this episode. Guys, you spent a bunch of time buying gadgets for yourself. Why not buy something for the mother of your kids or your own mother? Mother's Day is coming up, and Bowl and Branch sheets would make a great gift. The sheets from Bowl and Branch are made from 100% organic cotton, because organic cotton is incredibly soft, and the sheets get softer each time you wash them. I can easily tell when the Bowl and Branch sheets are on the bed, and I really appreciate them when I travel, and the sheets are clearly not Bowl and Branch soft. With Bull and Branch, you'll get the nicest sheets you've ever owned for about half the price of what stores and boutiques would be charging for sheets of far lower quality. I really could not believe how excited my wife was to get these new sheets, and the box that came in will make a great box for the mother in your life to collect pictures from the kids. Go to bullandbranch.com for 20% off your entire order by using the promo code TII. Again, that's bowlandbranch.com with bowl spelled B-O-L-L and use the promo code T-I-I. These sheets are only sold online at bowlandbranch.com and you can't buy them in any stores. That is how they keep the pricing low and free of markups. But here's the best part. Don't take my word for it. Try them out for yourself for 30 days risk-free. Bowl and Branch is so sure that you're going to fall in love with your sheets that they will give you your 30 nights to try them out. And if you or your significant other, for some reason, doesn't love them for any reason, they will take them back and refund you without any hassle at all. Go online to Bowl and Branch. Again, that's B-O-L-L and branch.com and use promo code TII for 20% off your entire order of sheets, towels, blankets, duvet covers, everything else. Plus, using the promo code, you'll get free shipping to boot. Good morning, Rob. This is Skip in Toronto calling to see what advice you'd have regarding battery life. Is there an easy way to determine which app is causing my app, uh, my uh, iPhone 5 to drain? It seems that uh, within a couple of hours, I'm down to about uh, 10 or 15%. Uh, any suggestions? Thanks for your help. All you do. Thanks. Bye. Skip, thanks for the voicemail message. And this is actually an easy one. Apple has this for you. They got you covered. Go to the settings app. Scroll down to battery. Click on battery. And then scroll down and you'll see battery usage. And it'll show you the last 24 hours or the last seven days. And you can even put a little clock. There's a little clock to the right there. If you tap that, it'll show you how long it was. But for example, for me, the last 24 hours, 45% of my battery usage was due to the mail and the background activity. And then 18% due to the phone and the podcast app was 11%. So that will tell you which apps are chewing up your battery. Again, go to settings, battery, and there it is right for you. Into the email bag we go. Hi Rob, my Logitech K760 Bluetooth keyboard works just fine on my Apple TV. Now, so now what? That is 
it's great to have for entering into the edit boxes, but how about more? How about Word for Apple TV? Typing Tutor apps. We only have to be a short step away from Apple putting Safari on Apple TV. Then could Facebook, Google, and Twitter be that far behind? All not terribly likely, but fun to contemplate. Or not, Kevin Barry. Thanks, Kevin. And yes, it would really be nice now that Apple TV, the latest update, supports Bluetooth keyboards to see more use for those keyboards. From Chris in London, quote, What does the SE stand for? Apple has finally confirmed what the SE and the new iPhone's name is for. The new phone's name stands for Special Edition, according to Phil Schiller, Apple's head of marketing, unquote. Well, thanks, Chris. Per the SE, I think we may see it on a two-year update cycle. This is a, I have this kind of feeling that this is the lower cost version and they're only going to update it once every two years with the iPhone and the iPhone Pro, which will be the new names, on the yearly update and dropping the whole S label. So essentially, come September, we would go to three iPhones for sale from Apple. You'd have the iPhone, that would be the whole name, which will be the new 4.7 incher with the A10 processor. You'd have the iPhone Pro at 5.5 inches, also with the A10 processor. And then you'd have the iPhone SE with the A9 processor. Again, with the iPhone and iPhone Pro on yearly updates, but keeping their names as is. So in 2017, it would just be the iPhone 2017 version with the A11 processor. And the SE would not get updated until spring of 2018, and will go from the A9 to the A11 processor at that time as well. Of course, Apple likes to keep the previous year's models for sale. It may still do so, but in the BRIC countries, not in the U.S., And at that time, rebrand the older units with a new name to differentiate them. Okay, clearly I don't have all the details on this worked out. But it does seem with the iPhone SE name and the thought of the iPhone 12 or something like that or an iPhone 18 or iPhone 13, that that kind of name sounds silly, that Apple does need to change the, the other names. And I'm leaning heavily towards the iPhone 7 name never coming into being. We are now over 3,000 members in our Google Plus community and growing. Thanks to everyone that has joined and thanks for the great posts. One new post in the Google Plus community that went up since the last episode came out was from Myron Euchre, who posted the following. Quote, has anyone else realized that with all the focus on the iOS 9.3, iPhone SE, and the 9.7-inch iPad Pro, that we have yet to hear rumors about iOS 10 or whatever they're going to call it, WWDC is only a couple of months away, and usually we have pretty strong rumors by now on well, what Apple has planned for the next release of iOS, unquote. To which Bob Burke replied, quote, I heard a thought that the next OS for Mac was going to be called Mac OS, but I did hear that on Ken Ray's Mac OS Ken podcast, unquote. Gary Belt said, quote, the only thing that has been revealed thus far is that It will have Siri, whether you can just say, hey, Siri, at will, or it will be more like Siri of old time, time will tell. Unquote. Apple Dystopia replied, quote, I'm hoping they don't cram a bunch of features into it, creating yet another buggy release, unquote. And there was a couple of sentiments of ditto on that. And I'll say, Myron, I agree with you on the rumor front. What is expected to be added to iOS 10 is very, very limited right now as far as rumors. This year, the rumor mill for iOS updates and WWC, WDC are way behind where we normally see them. We're really only about two months or about 10 weeks out from the keynote. I would expect rumors to start coming out in force by the end of this month. But so far, we're really well behind where I would expect us to be. Since the last episode, there were also dozens and dozens of other new posts and comments in the TII Google Plus community, which is an Android fanboys free zone and spammer free zone. Yep, it is the most civil Google Plus community covering iOS. Folks, go to todayinios.com slash community to join in. And thanks to all 3,000 plus of you already in the community and contributing. Also from Google Plus community were these comments per the last episode, which again, I always post, uh, or always pin, I should say, the last episode at the top of the community. From Nick Bracken, quote, Lock Notes will work with all iCloud notes, not just local notes on your iOS device. The latest update to OS X and iCloud lets you open them with password that has been set. 
you can't lock a note on iCloud.com, but you can on a Mac, unquote. From Myron Uecker, quote, Hearing the person who updated without a backup, when the first beta of iOS 93 came out, it broke syncing with Garmin watches. Several people updated without a backup and were out of luck until the issue was fixed in the third beta. Backups are a good thing, especially before major iOS updates and installing betas, unquote. And from John Poiser, quote, I updated my 6 plus 6S Plus from 9.2.1 to 9.3 yesterday following the recommended procedure. It went flawlessly, and I immediately noticed my iPhone was more responsive, less sluggish. Everything works a little faster now. Uh, now I just don't know how much is due to the reset of network settings or how much is due to 9.3 update, but overall, me likey. After seven betas, I felt pretty good about this upgrade, unquote. Those of you that are long-time listeners know college basketball is my favorite sport, but Major League Baseball for me is number two. And it is nice how when one ends, the other picks up. And if you are a Major League Baseball fan like me and are on T-Mobile in the U.S. or thinking of switching, here is some great news. From April 3rd to April 10th, and just from April 3rd to April 10th, T-Mobile customers can sign up to get MLB.TV Premium for free. Free as in zip, nada, nothing to you for this whole season. Yeah, baby. And again, you have to sign up between April 3rd and 10th. Here's something from their Q&A. Can I use MLB.TV on multiple devices? Their answer, yes. After a successful offer redemption, you can access MLB.TV premium on any compatible connected device using your MLB.com account which can be created when you redeem the offer if you don't already have an MLB.com account. Question, does my free subscription to MLB.TV Premium expire? Answer, yes. Your free subscription to MLB.TV Premium expires on February 28th, 2017. Question, does my subscription to MLB.TV Premium give me a subscription to MLB.com at Bat Premium mobile application? Answer, yes. Your MLB Dot .tv premium subscription includes a subscription to mlb.com at bat premium for the 2016 regular season at no extra cost for supported iPhone, iPod, Touch, and iPads. So, if you are a Major League Baseball fan like me, go to T-Mobile between the 3rd, which is what you hear now, and between April 10th to sign up. Go Royals, go Mets. I should point out here, you do need to register for an MLB.com account, free registration. When doing so, the password needs to be 8 to 15 characters long, with one upper, one lowercase letter, and one number. So if you get to an error page, that's probably why. And you also need to be on a T-Mobile network and not on Wi-Fi. And I'll say this, I tried signing up here early afternoon on the 3rd, and I was having issues, so I wasn't able to. So you want to probably keep on trying. They're probably inundated with people trying to register. But again, when registering for the Major League Baseball account and doing all of this, look for, first look for the link in the show notes for this, and then make sure you're on your T-Mobile phone and not on Wi-Fi. One new item that Apple introduced, or really just added to their store, not much of an introduction, is the USB-C to Lightning cable. This is nice for those with the 12.9-inch iPad Pro as you can use this with the 29-watt USB-C power adapter that comes with a 12-inch MacBook to fast charge your iPad Pro. As briefly mentioned earlier, fast charging is only supported by the 12.9-inch iPad Pro and not the new 9.7-inch iPad Pro, which if you went to charge the iPad Pro from almost any dead state, you're going to know it takes a while to charge the 12.9-inch iPad Pro. You can also use the USB-C to lightning cable to sync with your USB-C MacBook as well. Thanks to Kristen London for the heads up on this next one. Seems if you buy the new iPad Pro 9.7 inch and plan on using last year's 9.7 inch iPad Air smart cover, um, yeah, not so much. Yes, the devices are the same size, but Apple had to move the magnets a little bit, and that causes the, la the, the last flap on the cover to float above the iPad and not close. So some magnets repelling each other. Apple says the movement of the magnets was necessary because of the new keyboard connector on the side, which is needed for the new smart keyboard. 
Some are saying this was done on purpose to make it such that you could not reuse the older smart cover, and given that Apple is charging $39 for the old one for the iPad Air 2 and $49 for the new one for the Apple Pro 9.7 inch, even though they are basically the same thing, just with the magnets moved, that difference in price for the same basic thing seems to back up a little bit those that said it was designed obsolescence. I don't think it was such, but I do feel the extra $10 is not warranted given that they're the same basic cover. Really, Apple? Really? Walt Mossberg had a really nice article on seven things he would like to see in the next-gen iPhones, which he says Apple really needs to do to jump back up as clearly the best smartphone. He also pointed out the Galaxy S7 is a very good phone. I held one this past week, and I will say, and use it a little bit, and I'll say this. It is the first Android phone I have held that felt quality-wise like an iPhone. As Walt points out, it is still hampered by having to run that buggy mess of an OS called Android. Paraphrasing a little there. But point is, the S7 hardware-wise, and fit and finish and feel, it, it, it just feels like it's on par with the iPhone. And Apple needs to up its game big time to get back that lead. Per the seven things Walt wants to see, first is for Apple to make a big leap in battery life, even if it means going a little thicker than thinner. Latest rumors are thinner for the next gen iPhone, but I'm 100% with Walt on this. If it meant going two millimeters thicker versus two millimeters thinner, and the end result was greatly improved battery life versus having to lug around an extra battery pack, I would be all for the thicker. Really, the iPhone does not need to be as thin as it is right now. And it definitely does not need to be any thinner. Battery life trumps thinness, at least according to anyone I know. Plus, how thin is it really if you have to put a case on it with a battery? Second item from Walt is per charging of the devices and how long it takes. He points out that while, quote, iPhones aren't especially slow at charging, but Samsung is now faster, and there are companies working on systems that offer somewhat uh, less battery life in exchange for ultra-quick charging that can take as little as five minutes, unquote. And while talking about charging, he also puts in a wish for wireless charging. So item 2 is really faster charging for item 2A and wireless charging for 2B. Third is about the top and bottom bezels, as in them being much too large, he points out that the key selling point on the SE is not the smaller screen, but the smaller body, making it easier to hold. By reducing the bezels, you reduce the size of the body, and you can increase, or you can increase the size of the screen. Personally, I think they would go with the smaller body over yet another screen size. And per the bezel, yes, you could shrink it a bit on the top, but to shrink on the bottom... That means doing away with the home button and Touch ID on its own, and then moving Touch ID under the screen. And that means going with Sapphire for the screen for best results, or offering up a subpar experience when your screen is scratched or cracked. Yes, the top bezel clearly has room to be shrunk, but the bottom one? That's a big change. That said, there are rumors out there about no more home button and Touch ID integrated under the screen, so maybe we'll see that. His fourth wish is for optical zoom. The dual lens camera that has been rumored is one way this may be achieved. He goes on to say low light capabilities need to be greatly improved on the iPhone, as does taking photos quicker, something he points out that the new S7 does better than the iPhone right now. His fifth desire has to do with making the iPhone more robust making it much more water-resistant and much more resistant to drops without cracking. As he says, the iPhone screens are prone to cracking on small drops, and the case is so slippery, no one dares carry it around naked, so you don't get to see how pretty it is anyway, because they're all wrapped up in big, bulky cases. Kind of like having Sophia Vargas as your new girlfriend and showing up to family reunion with her wrapped up in a snowsuit like the kid from A Christmas Story. By the way, it's very likely he will get this wish. No, not Sophia Vargas as his girlfriend, but a more sturdy iPhone as it is likely to be highly water resistant. And if he gets the smaller bezel wish, then it could be Sapphire as well. Someone purchased uh, all those furnaces for the Sapphire 
just saying, so they're out there somewhere. His sixth hankering was for Apple to take the 16 gigabyte storage level out behind the building and put a bullet in its head. Hmm, not heard of that request before. Kind of new around these parts. Yeah, 16 don't buy me gigabytes should have been put out to pasture in 2015. Walt even suggests 64 gig being the min storage level possibly. Absolutely want that, but it will not happen. I will be happy just to see the 32 barely adequate gigabytes for the base model. As for a seventh and final yearning, here's Walt's own words. Quote, finally, as I've written before, Apple needs to up its game in iPhone software. Its mail app needs to do a much better job of handling Gmail, which has a billion users, even if rival Google makes that hard. Users should be able to select their own favorite apps for core functions. Apple Maps and Siri both need much more work to be consistently reliable, and it's time to make iMessage, which works well, cross-platform, unquote. Really can't argue with any of what he mentioned there. And overall, I agree. This next upgrade to the iPhone and the iPhone Pro in 2016 versions, it needs to be a multi-generational jump in performance, not just a single incremental change. I held and played with the S7 last week. And the gap is not just narrowed. In some ways, the gap is now on the wrong side. Harry's last month sent me over a nice box of goodies. In that box was the new Truman Razor. This is the one with their new rubber handle. The wife has totally confiscated that for herself. She likes the nice rubber grip for the shower, but it uses the same great Harry's five German engineered and manufactured blades. And if you go to harrys.com, that's H-A-R-R-Y-S.com and use promo code TII, you'll save $5 on your first order. Also in that kit, I received some of the shave gel, which is so nice. No phosphates, no toxic chemicals, just good stuff for your skin. As I said, the blades are incredible. There are five of them, not three or four, but five. No cuts, no burns, and it's absolutely the best shave I've ever had, and, I, and it's at an incredibly great price. Why pay $32 for an eight-pack of blades when you can get them at half that price at harrys.com? And yes, I do buy them for the most part. They don't always send me these samples all the time. I actually now have enough blades to get me well through not just 2016, but really through 2017, regardless of what happens at Father's Day, which I'm sure there'll be more coming. Harry's went out and found a German blade factory that was almost 100 years old and purchased it. Harry's owns the most important part of the razor, the blade, and by cutting out the middleman on both sides, that means they can keep the price low to you. Plus, Harry's as an organization helps those looking for jobs by donating 1% of their sales and 1% of their time to help prepare people for professional success. Yes, a shave that feels great from a company you can feel great about. Once again, go to harrys.com now. Save $5 off when you enter the code TII with your first purchase. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Enter the coupon code TII at checkout to save $5 on your first purchase. Start shaving better right now. Hi, Rob. It's Clinton from Canada. I really enjoy your show. But I have a question for you and the listeners about Instant Hotspot. I've got it working between my iPhone and iPad. But whenever the connection goes to sleep um, due to lack of use, I have to go back into the Wi-Fi settings menu and choose my iPhone again. Have I got something wrong? Uh, I would love it if it just reconnected automatically to my iPhone without that manual step. And I thought that was kind of the whole point of uh, Instant Hotspot. I've had a little bit of a look around the internet, but I uh, haven't found a conclusive answer for this. So again, I just wanted to try to get uh, the Instant Hotspot to pick up the data connection from my iPhone after it's gone to sleep um, automatically. Thanks for your time. All the best. Bye-bye. Clinton, thanks for the voicemail message. And yes, I don't like that either. I have had an annoying time where I lose connection when I'm hotspotting and then I have to go and try to refine my hotspot. It's, it doesn't automatically refine it, even on my MacBook. If anyone has any solutions on this, please let us know. Give us a call, 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOON-DOG. Or shoot an email to todayinios at gmail.com. Into the email bag we go. Hey, Rob, I was on the Apple website today and was looking for the 
at the successes and wondered how much the 64 gig model would cost. So I clicked on continue and then it brought me to a page called iPhone accessories. And so I looked at them and at the bottom, there were a pair of Beats ear pods and a pair of Beats headphones. Now they were wireless headphones and ear pods. So I was thinking that there are many rumors about the iPhone 7 with no headphone jack. So I think Apple is trying to point customers to buying wireless headphones and ear pods so they don't have to figure it out uh, when they get an iPhone 7. Anyway, that is just what I think and might not be true. Thanks for the show, Rob. Regards, Matthew in Canada. Well, hi, Matthew, and thanks for the email. And that goes with some other rumors of late that Apple might include wireless earbuds with the next generation iPhone. And if you want, optionally, then the wired earbuds the ones that plug into the lightning port would be available for sale. Again, optionally. One of those rumors shows where the wireless earbuds would split in two with a lightning plug. So basically you crack it in half and inside there would be a lightning plug that you would plug into the lightning port to power it. And I can neither confirm nor deny I made that rumor up, but the point is if Apple does supply wireless earbuds, uh, they need to, have to, come up with a novel and very, very easy way to recharge said wireless earbuds when you're out and about. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. My Apple Watch burns through battery a- after the update. I don't know if it's iOS 9.3 or with uh, Watch OS 2.2, but Apple Watch burns through the battery. I unpaired Apple and had to do a reset to pair the watch and the iPhone together again. We'll see how long the battery will last now. Regards, Hansel. Not sure if anyone else had this issue, but on this trip this past week, I noticed my Apple Watch battery life was actually much better than I had been seeing. So for me, the update to 9.3 and the last watchOS actually seems to have improved the battery life. And Hansel did report back saying, quote, Hi Rob, after the restart, no problems. I haven't noticed the same issue. Regards, Hansel. So again, at least for me, the latest update to 9.3 and now 9.3.1 and the latest watchOS, I've seen better battery life. And another email here. Hi Rob, why do broadcasters keep describing the iPhone SE as a 4-inch iPhone? If it resembles the 5 most closely, then it's a 5-inch. Name redacted. Um, because the screen is 4 inches and not 5 inches? Screen sizes for the iPhones are as following. For the 4S and earlier, 3.5 inches. For the 5, 5S, 5C, and SE, 4 inches. For the 6 and 6S, 4.7 inches. And the 6 Plus and 6S Plus, 5.5 inches. This week for a Kickstarter project, we have the Bullet Train Magic Pencil Holder for Apple Pencil and iPad Pro. This one had a goal of just $4,700. Way to go, guys. Which it has reached. Another way to go, guys. And you have until April 12th at 11.43 a.m. to fund it for yourself and get one for yourself or more. The bullet train, one word, as this as the description on the page. Quote, a beautifully streamlined dock that allows you to simply attach your Apple Pencil to your iPad Pro, a dock for the pencil to call home, unquote. They do a good job on their page by including a picture of the tray next to the iPads in the Apple Store where the Apple Pencils sit. Apple knows you need a place to store store it, they say. So that is why they created the bullet train. Apple recently announced they are selling replacement tips for the Apple Pencil. And someone in the Google Plus community asked why you would need a replacement tip. And I said, when you drop one, you'll know why it comes with a replacement tip and why Apple is now selling them. The bullet train comes in black, red, white, and blue. And it looks like you just stick it to the flat surface and when the Apple Pencil then sticks to it. And it even sticks over the top of the smart keyboard cover when closed. Check out the video on this one. Pricing on this is $39 for one, $69 for two, with shipments starting in July. Again, search for Bullet Train, one word, in kickstarter.com. Or you can go look in the show notes uh, for Today in iOS, episode 388. Again, you have it just until April 12th to fund this one. Thanks to Dr. John and others that sent in this next one. Well, Apple is getting into the content creation game with their own TV series. This will be a non-scripted TV show about app devs. Black Eyed Peas singer Will I Am is involved, as is producer Ben Silverman, who will also produce The Office and Jane the Virgin. 
I would imagine this will be available to Apple TV and iTunes users for free once it, once it comes out. In the meantime, if you want to see a story about developers, get the HBO Now app and then sign up for that service. It's $15 a month, and then you can watch Silicon Valley. Great, great show. Oh, and then there is that other show, Game of Thrones, uh, that you'll get when you sign up as well. Hi, Rob. I found this article about Apple's new robot, Liam, and found this article very interesting. Thanks for the show. Regards, Matthew from Canada. Well, thanks, Matthew, for the heads up on this. And the article talked about how some think in the video of the robot, Liam, where he's taking apart iPhones, that it was showing a next-gen iPhone since it does not appear that it have the camera bump on the back. However, as pointed out in the article, no, Apple would not show a next-gen product in their own video five months before it's unveiled. I did read another article about Liam, and while Apple kind of made it sound like it was a one-of-a-kind, the article said for it to be meaningful, Apple really need to have many Liams, because given the numbers Apple presented and for how long it takes to strip down an old iPhone, Liam would be lucky to strip out over a little, little over $1 million a year. As we all know, Apple sells many times that a number in a single week. They will need a good size team of Liams to make a dent on the whole repurposing or stripping down of iPhones. Into the email bag. Dear Rob, I'm hoping to get a suggestion for a good VNC app for iOS. It will be used on the new iPad Pro 9.7 inch. And that uses the SSH protocol when connecting to a Mac remotely. I have only found screens VNC by Edova at $19.99 US. In all of my searches, there must be other good apps. Thanks for answering my request. Regards, Fernando. Folks, let us know what you would recommend for Fernando for a good VNC app. Shoot us an email, todayinios at gmail.com, or give us a call, 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moon Dog. Back to the email bag. Hey, Rob. Have you heard of anyone experiencing issues with their read receipts in iMessage? I just updated to iOS 9.3, full restore through iTunes using no backup to restore from. I decided to forfeit my 9.0.2 jailbreak to try out 9.3. Totally not worth it because of this flaw. The only reason I did it is because my iPad Air 2 is still jailbroken on 9.0.2, which shows the read receipts. I should also mention uh, read receipts on my iPhone will sometimes show up, but not always like it should. Very annoying. Thanks. Love the show. Oshkosh, Josh. Hi, Josh. I have not heard of this issue. Obviously, I would recommend you update to iOS 9.3.1 if you have not already. If anyone else has had this issue and fixed it, let us know how. Give us a call or shoot us an email. Hi, Rob. This is Kim from Salem, Oregon. And... I just sent you a website link from the uh, New Yorker, I think it was. I was looking on Mac Daily News, and I saw this website, that this article that talked about the <laughs> FBI accidentally spilling water on the uh, iPhone they were trying to unlock. And I'm not sure if it's true or not. It might just be a satire thing, but it's absolutely hilarious. Anyway, I love the show, and keep up the good work. Bye for now. Hi, Kim. Thanks for the voicemail message. And it was just satire. The FBI did not actually pour water on the iPhone after they jailbroke it, which was, or cracked it, hacked it, whatever you want to call. Yeah, the, basically the article said that, hey, the FBI finally unlocked it, and in the midst of high-fiving and celebrating, they knocked water over and, and ruined the iPhone. Funny satire, but just satire, not a real story. We mentioned on the last episode that the FBI said they thought they had a solution to open the terrorist iPhone and that they drew their, withdrew their legal case in California on getting Apple to add a backdoor. Since then, the FBI has confirmed they have unlocked said iPhone and do have access to it. So the method they thought would work, they are now claiming did work and will work for other iPhones. Or to quote the DOJ, quote, the FBI has now successfully retrieved the data stored on the San Bernardino's terrorist iPhone and therefore no longer requires assistance from Apple required by this court order, unquote, said DOJ spokeswoman Melanie Newman. For their part, Apple said the court case, wa- quote, 
should have never been brought, unquote. And Apple reiterated its objection to the FBI's demand that the company build a backdoor into the iPhone step Apple said would have, quote, set a dangerous precedent. Apple believes deeply that people in the United States and around the world deserve data protection, security, and privacy. Sacrificing one for the other only puts people and countries at greater risk, unquote. The GOJ and the FBI have not said how they did this or who did this for them. The FBI has not said if they will let Apple know how the hack was done, but if other legal cases like the one in Brooklyn are continued, they likely will have no choice but to reveal the method to Apple and the courts. Most likely, the Justice Department will withdraw its case in Brooklyn and just have the FBI unlock the phones they have with the method that they used. On that note, the FBI has assured law enforcement across the U.S. that it will help unlock mobile devices such as iPhones involved in ongoing investigations, quote, when it is allowed by law and policy, unquote. In a letter to local authorities, it said that the FBI, quote, understands the challenges they face and that they lack necessary tools to monitor and investigate the communications of suspects who use encrypted mobile devices. As has been our longstanding policy, the FBI will, of course, consider any tool that might be helpful to our partners. Please know that we will continue to do everything we can to help you consistent with our legal and policy constraints, unquote. The FBI said in the letter that it was aware of the, quote, worldwide publicity and attention that was generated by the Apple litigation, unquote, and that the FBI was committed to maintaining, quote, an open dialogue with local enforcement. We are in this together, unquote. And by this, if they mean a big pile of steaming cow dung, absolutely could not agree more. Technically, there are a lot of questions about how this was done and who did this. Some think it was a new yet unknown by Apple bug in iOS 9 and maybe even in early versions as well. Clearly, Apple wants to know if this was the case. And don't be surprised if you don't see a countersuit by Apple to get the details revealed on this. Others think maybe it was a brute force attack where they cloned the phone's memory, tried 10 passcodes, they did not work, the phone is erased, they refreshed the phone with the clone, try the next 10, and so on and so on until they got the right code. But I will put out one of my own theories on this. Now call me crazy. But on February 18th, John McAfee said he could crack the iPhone and it would take him about a month to do it. Almost exactly 30 days later, the FBI said, never mind, we have someone that showed us they can do it. On top of that, he went on YouTube video at the end of February saying he could do it. And then two days later, he said, never mind, I was just kidding to get publicity. Or was he just lying about lying? Look, most people consider John McAfee one of the smartest technical minds out there even if said mine has a few, let's call them, bugs or glitches. It just seems strange, 32 days after he first said he could crack it in a month, the FBI said they had someone that could crack it. And they are not saying who it is. Sure, some people are theorizing it's a company from Israel. But me? I think it just might be old crazy John McAfee. I want to give a little postscript to this whole F Apple FBI debacle. I think when you look at the facts you will see the FBI really blundered in many, many ways on this. I'm sure there'll be books written about this whole episode. <laughs> Definitely reports inside the FBI are going to be written about this. First off, the FBI claimed from the beginning it was about one iPhone belonging to terrorists that killed multiple Americans, and it was not about setting a precedent. This was clearly BS from day one. And in front of Congress, the FBI said it would set a precedence. Duh. So right from the start, they were not being honest with the American people. They also did a very dirty tactic of using the case of a terrorist to pull at the heartstrings of Americans. Plus, I'm sure they figured Apple would not want to fight that case, who wants to look like they are on the side of terrorists. And that was how the FBI framed Apple in this fight, and Apple clearly would not go public on this and, and, give, in, and give in rather quickly. I mean, that had to be the, the mindset of the FBI. They were wrong. That leads us to the other big mistake. They tried to make this a PR battle by going public first. And let's face facts. The FBI and the DOJ on the PR front is like a second grade Pee Wee football team going against an NFL Super Bowl winning team. When you look at the Apple PR machine, that is. 
I think the FBI overestimated the power of the terrorist card. Or put another way, the FBI looked at the terrorist card as the broadsword owned by Ned Stark. Sure, it's a powerful weapon and made of Valerian steel. But what good is it if you put it in the hands of Sansa Stark and ask her to go up against the mountain? The FBI was just not ready for Apple to go on the offensive. After all, Apple never really does. But Apple had to, and they were right to. And Apple clearly presented the issues with the FBI's case. It's hard to say how that would have gone in court. But I think by the end of the case, it was clear in the court of public opinion, and it swung in Apple's favor with all the tech companies and all the press behind Apple. The irony in all of this is if the FBI had kept their mouth shut, never forced the issue publicly, back-channeled for someone to unlock the phones, they would now have a way to unlock iPhones and the bad guys would not know it. The FBI really blundered this for themselves. But on the positive side for all of us, Apple's big call to action was to slow down this process and to get a public debate going on the whole issue. Apple now has some breathing room on that front, And they clearly have shown they are very, very willing to break their traditional silence and come out and publicly talk about privacy issues and Apple's products. Privacy was a cornerstone of the founding of this country. It seems all too often bad events are used to break down the privacy we should all enjoy in the U.S. Maybe I'm channeling a little too much Dan Carlin here, but that's just how I feel. And I'm proud to be an Apple fanboy, given how Apple is fighting much harder for my privacy than the U.S. government appears to be. Just saying. From Larry D. in the Google Plus TII community, ask Siri to set the timer to 1,000 minutes. Set timer for 1,000 minutes. Okay, your timer is set for 16 hours and 40 minutes. Set timer for 1,000 minutes. Done. I love a good countdown. Set timer for 1,000 minutes. Roger that. T minus 16 hours and 40 minutes and counting. Set timer for 1,000 minutes. Okay, I set it. Just remember, a watched iPhone never boils. Thanks again to Bowl and Branch for sponsoring this episode. Folks, go right now to bowlandbranch.com. That's bowl spelled B-O-L-L and use promo code T-I-I to save 20% off the nicest sheets and cotton products you've ever owned with free shipping to boot. And before we go today, I want to remind you to send in your feedback to the show, 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moondog. Or record your feedback and email to the show at todayinios at gmail.com. Feedback can be a question or comment per something someone said on this episode. Or it can be a question or rant you have about something else. An app or product review, good or bad, as long as it's iOS related, it is welcomed. I'm always looking for new artwork to feature that you have created on iOS device. Just put some TII branding on it and send it in. And of course, we're always looking for more music created on iOS device to play on the show. It's your show, and your feedback is greatly desired. Don't forget also to check out the moderated Google Plus community by going to todayinios.com slash community. Thanks again to Harry's for sponsoring this episode. Please go to harrys.com now and save $5 off when you enter the code TII with your first purchase. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com and enter the coupon code TII at checkout to save $5 and start shaving better today. Or, well, at least as soon as your new kit arrives at your doorstep. Finally, check out the newly updated TII app, which is free to you. Search for TII in the iTunes App Store. It is the best way to consume the show and to get push notifications each time a new episode of TII is released. Fully voiceover friendly, of course. Please go right now and download the TII app. And that, folks, is going to do it for us today. Until the next time, I'm your host, Rob, reminding you to phone different. This show is hosted on Libsyn.com and part of the Wizard Media Network. If you are looking for hosting, go to Libsyn.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, for hosting for your podcast and for creation of your own smartphone app. The Today in iOS podcast can also be found on the free Stitcher radio app. Just search for T-I-I. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.